good evening. It's, um, it's, it's really a tough act to follow Mindy. Um, and she's not passionate at all, you can tell. Right? Um, I'm assuming everyone in the room knows Staples. Um, we had our humble beginnings just down the street, actually in Brighton, Massachusetts, about 26 and a half years ago. Um, we opened our first store. Um, back then, we were strictly a retail organization. Uh, I've been with the company for 23 years. When I started, we had 35 stores here in the Northeast. Today, <clears throat> Staples is a very different looking organization. It's you know, 88,000 associates in 26 countries around the world. Um, an interdependent global supply chain that probably is four times that number of countries. Um, our contract business is actually a bigger part of our business than our retail business, so our B2B business is bigger today. And we actually operate the uh, second largest e-commerce site in the world behind Amazon.com. So in the 23 years I've been with the company, the, the, the scope and the breadth of our company has fundamentally changed. And with that, it's interesting because it's, it's provided us unique opportunities to help businesses transform themselves. And as we start to look at things like sustainability and, and climate change, I think it puts us in a very unique position potentially as well. Um, our formal journey, you know, learning journey as, as, as I'd like to call it, relative to sustainability started about 11 years ago at Staples. Now I would suggest that we've been trying to do some of this for 26 years or so and not really called it sustainability. Um, and we were different than a lot of other organizations. If you look at his, sort of a historical view of, of sustainability and, and, and environmental um, movements within corporate America, you know, it really came from the compliance part of, uh, <coughs> of business. And that was really the lowest common denominator, making sure that we weren't going to go to jail, right, for violating the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act and, and so forth. Then about 15 years ago, you know, thanks to efforts from folks like Ceres and and obviously leaders like Lee Kane and, and Whole Foods and others, you know, companies and organizations said that, you know, we need to become a little bit more transparent in what we do and what we don't do, and we need to start to communicate that to stakeholders, whether it's shareholders or employees or customers, and, and start to create sort of a common language. So this whole movement toward corporate social responsibility and obviously the Global Reporting Initiative and trying to create a way to, to wrap your head and your arms around, you know, um, metrics that were kind of squishy you know, started to develop. But what was really interesting is that even back then, you know, those efforts sort of, uh, you know, were on the periphery of business and didn't necessarily feel like they were core to business. So I would suggest the biggest challenge that we've had within corporations, you know, aside from sort of the political polarization that's happened over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years around environmental, uh, environmentalism in general, has just been this lack of common language within, um, you know, within corporate America. And so for, for us, what we tried to do is to, is to really um, start you know, working on projects that were really fundamental to our business, um, where we could generate you know, um, very tangible returns okay, on investments. And um, so not surprisingly, we're not different than a lot of other companies. A lot of our efforts started within the four walls of our operations. So we looked at things like waste and energy and, and, um, and, uh, and, and fundamentally changing those dynamics. So for us, from a climate perspective, you know, what we needed to do first and foremost was really understand what was our footprint? I mean, what was the footprint within the four walls of our operation? So we were very fortunate that we worked through a number of collaboratives. You know, the EPA had a program, unfortunately it's no longer around called Climate Leaders, which helped us actually benchmark our baseline uh, carbon footprint for our scope one and scope, scope two emissions. So power that we purchase, you know, off the grid with our scope two emissions, scope one emissions where we were actually generating direct emissions from our fleets and so forth. And so for us, that was, a, that was really important for us to benchmark and understand where we were. From that, we decided to start to make sure that we were looking at a fully integrated, you know, energy and carbon po um, position within Staples so that we weren't looking at them as different. We sort of integrated them together, which really made all the sense in the world. So for, you know, for us, we have about 2,400 retail facilities and probably another uh, 500 uh, non-retail facilities in 26 countries. So, you know, certainly a big footprint in the built environment. So a lot of things we could do is, you know, right from the beginning, doing things like putting lease language into our leases that made sure that we were getting a specific building envelope and lighting system and HVAC system and so forth to make sure that we were reducing our energy impacts. Um, really investing in energy efficiency, particularly in our older buildings. Um, 
we're the largest, one of the largest users of, of renewable energy in the country. Actually, we just um, last week uh, converted 100% of all of our electric consumption in the United States to renewables. We were at 78% and today we're at 100%. Um, so we're very proud of that. Um, but again, we wanted to make sure before we were buying you know, renewable energy that we were using as, as little as we could to begin with. And um, we're also one of the largest users of on-site distributed generation. So we have about 15 megawatts of, of solar around the country on 40 plus buildings, ranging in size from 65 kilowatts to about two and a half megawatts of some big systems, some small systems. Um, we were one of the first companies in the United States to sign what, what's termed a third party ownership deal for renewable energies, where we actually would host solar on our facility a third party, in, in this case a, an investment bank, would own the system. Um, our partner would actually build and design the system and we would sign a contract that um, for a long period of time for a fixed price of energy. So not only is there a positive carbon benefit for us, but we have built in a long-term solar hedge as well. So this is, you know, again, it's very important that what we do is we don't just do this because it's right thing to do for the planet, but that we actually are creating market forces that fundamentally change the way that we think about things. So give, let me give you an example. You know, that third party solar ownership agreement um, is interesting because last year in the United States, 85% of all of the installed solar, both on commercial buildings and residential buildings, was done under third party ownership agreements. Now when we signed the deal, we were one of the first companies, and you can imagine the conversation I had with my CFO. You know, 95% of our real estate portfolio is leased not owned. So I went into John Maney, who is our, our, our CFO, and I said, hey John, here's the deal. We're gonna put a multi-million dollar asset on a roof we don't own, and the landlord doesn't own, and we're gonna sign a, we're gonna sign a contract for a term that exceeds our lease term. And he looked at me like, why would we ever do that, right? And what we had done though is, through our partner, we had kind of worked on making sure that we could mitigate the downside risk. So we put in a rollover provision that would allow us, if we moved out of the building, for example, to roll over the remaining term to the next tenant or landlord. And if the landlord you know, said, take that thing off the roof, I don't care if my tenant you know, wants to pay more for electricity, get it off the roof. We built in a portfolio agreement that would allow us to move and relocate a certain percentage of our portfolio at no cost okay, to Staples. Now, when I say no cost, the cost is being borne across the portfolio of projects that we have out there, but we're still paying less for our solar energy than we're paying for bundled power off of the grid and has more of a positive benefit. So again, those are the kinds of things that I think um, are really important for companies and individuals to start to think about is there are these really interesting mechanisms. Um, the solar panels didn't change. The technology's always been there. How it was financed and who the customer was fundamentally changed. Changed the rules of the game. So what's interesting about that from my perspective is that um, sustainability when you start to really um, work with folks like Ceres, and certainly you know, my colleague you know, Lee Kane from Whole Foods and others that I have a great deal of respect for, what you start to do is you create these uncommon collaboratives. You understand where there are opportunities, where there weren't opportunities before, to actually create a model that can fundamentally change the rules of the game and fundamentally change the market dynamics. But, you know, it really requires that business needs to change very, very, you know, and to look at their role very differently than they have historically. And I think that's what progressive companies are really starting to do today. Mindy mentioned uh, best practice, and we actually are working with the World Resources Institute in Washington um, on a project called Next Practices. So for those of you who have studied climate science and scientists say that we need to reduce our, our carbon impacts by 80% by 2050 in order to just stop the bleeding, um, we can't just put in CFLs and LED lighting. It's going to fundamentally have to change the way that we think about a lot of what we do every day and how businesses operate, by the way, and how customers operate. Um, we've made a lot of investments in things, and I don't want to get into too many specifics, but you know, we have a very large electric fleet, all electric fleet within our, our delivery fleet. Um, we have a number of um, CNG tractor trailers, so we're trying to, again, reduce those impacts. We need to move product from point A to point B. Um, our fleet manager is a really interesting guy, his name is Mike Payette, he comes from uh, Vermont, he's a pra pragmatic, practical old Yankee, and while he's been the one that has really been driving the move toward things like electric vehicles and new technology and so forth, he, sa he sat there and said, well, you know, we got 
you know, 2,000 vehicles in our fleet that, you know, we're not going to change tomorrow. What can we do? And this is back in 2006. And um, so, well, what if we could put a speed governor on the trucks and, and, and not have them go more than, say, 60 miles an hour? Um, you know, could we do that? So we called up Isuzu, who was our truck manufacturer, and asked if they could do it. And the first, the first response was, no, we're not going to let you do it. Proprietary software system, we can't let you do it. Well, as I said before, Mike is a pragmatic, practical old Yankee, and I think he talked to the CEO in Japan, because he did take a trip to Japan. And at least that's what his expense report said. You know, he went <laughs> but anyway, he came back with the authority to actually go and reprogram the trucks. So this is in 2006 now. So for a $7 investment per vehicle, okay, in one year, we dropped 1.2 million gallons of diesel savings to the bottom line. We reduced our greenhouse gas impact by 24, by 24 million pounds, okay. And um, John Meany, our CFO, do you think he thought this was voodoo economics? He liked that return, right? But my point, my point in saying that is that we need, we need companies and organizations that are willing to kind of push the envelope with new technologies and new models, but there's plenty of low-hanging fruit that just requires somebody to think differently about the opportunity. And the only way that you can do that is to create a space where folks within organizations feel comfortable and empowered to actually make those decisions. But that comes from a commitment at the top, and we've been very fortunate to have that commitment at Staples. Um, so a lot of what I've been talking about is really within the four walls of our operation. Um, and all of that is really neat. You'd say, wow, you know, you must be making some, some, some terrific strides to really reduce your carbon footprint, and we are. I mean, we've reduced our energy intensity per square foot of real estate that we occupy by 30% since 2005. We've improved the fuel economy of our trucks by 30%. We put in this, this program called Right Size Packaging, so when a product, when you order five items in a box, we have algorithms that basically figure out the size the box should be built and customize the box. So we reduce our material use by about 30%. We improve our carbon efficiency by 35%. We reduce things like air pillows and other things that we use for dunnage by 60%. So it's a, it's a great carbon story, but do you think that makes us more efficient and saves us a lot of money in doing so? Absolutely. So I mean, those are the kinds of things that you start to uncover once you start to look at sustainability through uh, your business or sustainability lens. All that is really interesting, but within the four walls of our operation, only 7% of our total carbon footprint globally resides within the four walls of our operation. Only 7%. So the big aha is, what do we do with the other 93% that are embedded in products, and packaging, and shipping from our suppliers? And to Mindy's point, the real power is in the marketplace. And the real power is in creating market-driven solutions by starting to work with your suppliers and vendors and create transparency where you're able to identify those opportunities and work collaboratively to actually reduce not only the impacts, but improve efficiency and usually take cost out of the business as well, or cost out of the model. So it's really a win-win-win. Um, and it really does provide you as a buyer with a whole other lens to, to, to look at, um, you know, to look at the relationships that you have with your with your customers. I'll give you just a couple of examples of where this is, is starting to pay dividends for us directly, uh, particularly as it relates to supply chain. As you can imagine, Staples sells a lot of paper, we sell a lot of furniture. So the natural systems that we rely on, you know, really are, are things like forests. So healthy, sustainable <coughs> forests are extremely important to us. A lot of the paper that we purchase here in the, in the United States comes from the southern, the southern part of the United States. And unfortunately, in the southeast, most of the landowner base are folks that own 250 acres of land or less. And usually it's been in the family. And there's a lot of pressure. There's development pressure. There's, there's uh, environmental pressure. There's a whole bunch of pressures on landowners to, to either sell their land or convert their land. But once that land is converted, what happens? It loses all the ecosystem service benefits that it has around carbon and water and biodiversity. So what we tried to do is to say, what if we use the carbon market, this emerging carbon market, to actually create a fundamentally different model in the Southeast? So we have a, we have a commitment as a company to purchase fiber and wood, wood products that are Forest Stewardship Council certified, which we believe has the highest level of rigor you know, in, the, in the industry. 
and not just environmental values, but social values. Again, the challenge was most of the, most of the land in the Southeast is not certified under any, certi any, um, any certification scheme. So we've been working with the Pacific Forest Trust, California, a number of other NGOs and some large companies like Home Depot and, and Columbia Forest Products and others to fundamentally change the rules of the game. And we've created a, 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 a collaborative called the Carbon Canopy. So the, the, the basic, you know, just the basic idea is if you're a small private landowner, instead of looking at those stands of forests out there as, as, as forests that I'm just gonna clear cut, okay, and bring to market, the idea is how could I more sustainably um, manage that land and do staggered harvest rotation of that, of that wood product and then get an annuity every year for the carbon benefit that that land provides. And there's methodology to measure that today, both the live carbon in trees that are growing and in the soil and also taking into account carbon that is being emitted from old trees that are dying and decaying. But what's really interesting is that we think that based on some of those the prices for carbon, this goes back to what Mindy said before, um, even in the voluntary market, that this could be something that would be very attractive for many landowners that would say to them, you know what, I don't need to flip my land, I don't need to sell it for, some, for, for development, I can, I can hang on to this legacy land that's been in my family for generations, I can pay the taxes, I can pay for a college education for my kids, okay, and for somebody like Staples, we know that we're gonna get a sustainable source of timber for many, many generations to come. So those are the unique opportunities of, I believe, market-driven systems that we're only starting to scratch the surface on. And that's why when Mindy was talking about you know, the power of the market and the power of capital markets, it's so incredibly important. I will tell you this though, you know, most of our retail customers, they don't care about this. It's too bad, but they don't. Um, they say they buy, they'll buy something that's b better for the environment, but they don't. Um, so what we're doing is we're fundamentally changing the rules of the game and trying to set the new normal. So if you walk into our copy centers today, for example, and you want to buy a copy job, it's being printed on 50% post-consumer recycled, for Stewardship Council certified, 96 bright, 24 pound paper. We don't charge you anymore. That's our standard copy. There's nothing in the copy center that says it's green offering. It's kind of like life cereal. Mikey liked it, it was good for him. Who knew, right? Um, and it's the same thing for us. We need to start to, 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 to make products that basically fundamentally shift the new normal and create the market demand that the consumer is not necessarily going to create on their own. I will say this though, in corporate America in the last 10 years since I've been in this, in this position, there's been a fundamental shift in purchasing requirements for companies like Staples. Requests for proposal and requests for information that come across my desk today are extremely sophisticated. 30, 35 pages worth of documentation looking for, you know, social criteria, environmental criteria, and carbon is <coughs> certainly, you know, probably one of the biggest pieces of criteria um, that companies are looking for. We can argue whether they use that criteria to actually make their purchasing decisions, but sending those signals out through the market is hugely powerful. And to think that we don't pay attention to that, we absolutely positively do. So I'm excited about sort of where we are, and I would agree with, with Mindy, you know, listening to the president's speech the other day, I think we have really arrived at, um, you know, an interesting, you know, opportunity for all of us. Um, and I think, you know, from Staples' perspective, I think the next big frontier for us is how can we actually start to build a business in the future that helps our business customers, our consumers, really develop a low carbon strategy on their own. Not only by the products that they buy, but actually create potentially business services that allow them to reduce their carbon footprint. These are things that we're starting to take a look at. We're not there yet, but clearly that's on the forefront. I would suggest that there's a lot that we still have to do. But the, the really exciting part of this is that we're moving. And I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, we just need to move a little faster. But anyway, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.